Good morning. I hope everybody has a pleasant morning today. Can, you, can I just see a nice smile on everybody's faces? Yeah, that's, that's better. That's better. I, I think I was blessed. I really want to say I was blessed during a time of worship. It really set the tone for us. It set the tone of of under really seeing God as He is, trying to understand God as He is, you know, the Lord of the armies, the Lord of the host, that there is no one like Him and that we worship Him, that He is holy, He is righteous and that the only way we can come before Him is through the blood of the Lamb. The only way that we have been made worthy is because of the sacrifice of Jesus and that we can go con in confidence before Him knowing that He has cleansed us and that we do not stand condemned but we stand saved and we stand blessed in his, in his, before Him. And, and we have been looking at the book of 1 John uh, on the past couple of Sundays we had other speakers come so we, the topic was different but we have been focusing on the book of 1 John and we will continue doing that today as well. Uh, we had gone through the chapter 1 and we had Stop the chapter 2 verse 11 really to summarize this this book was written by the apostle John uh, to help the church to understand how our relationship with God is how our relationship with God is to be how our relationship with the evil one was how our relationship with sin was and how it is supposed to be it also was warning us or rather he was also warning us against false teachers and false doctrines that were really happening during that time and the only way we could really face it is by being strong in the word you see this foundational aspect of our relationship is very important and the apostle John made sure that we understand that even before he says anything he says Listen, understand your foundation. That you are, this God is a holy God, the creator of everything and you are his children. And he talks about the forgiveness that we have through him. And he talks about the aspect of our confession that we can go, that we can confess our sins before him. And know that we, we, we at no time are found really without sin but we know that when we do sin and if we do sin we can still go before our God and ask for forgiveness and the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all sin. We have the grace of God available for us by which we can live. And he goes on to say that it is, it is through him he is our advocate. The only reason that we can really stand before God is because Jesus Christ himself is our advocate who stands on our behalf interceding for us. He talks about this new commandment of love, this new commandment of us living in the light, living and walking in love with one another. He's saying if you do that you are found to be his children but if you do not, you are not found doing that, you really are not his children. And he's, he's, he's actually going through this whole letter in stages. He's, he's going through this whole letter. He's opening up. Eventually he's trying to open up new, new things to us. He's trying to explain to us even much more what it is about this whole relationship. What it is about our walk with the Lord. If you walk in the light as He is in the light. He talks about this fellowship that they have with God and that we have with God and we have with one another because of Jesus and he's trying to explain to us he's trying to tell us you look it's so it's so beautiful it's so wonderful and we all need to get it we all need to understand this relationship that we have this walk that we are supposed to walk just as Jesus walked And from there on, we will continue now today, from chapter 2 verse 12 onwards. And I thought I would share a lot, but I realized I could share only verse 4 verses today. 
Because there was so much in those four verses that I couldn't go further than that. So let's read it aloud. Alright, chapter 12, so chapter 2, verse 12 to 14. Or rather, I'll read further, but let's read till 14 now. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Now when I first read these verses, I was wondering what is John trying to say? Why is he wasting ink? You know, why, is he, why is he repeating himself? He already said the thing. Why is he saying it again twice? What am I supposed to get out of this? What are we supposed to get out of this? You see, when I look at it, just from just simple reading, I may think he is talking to little children in terms of the children that we have in, in our midst. And then the young men and then the, uh, the older people. But that's not what he is talking about. What John is pointing out to the church is the spiritual maturity of the congregation. Of the different kinds of people that are there in our midst. And he's calling them as little children. He's calling them as children. He's calling them as young men. And he's calling them as fathers. And this is not, as I said, to be understood in the terms of our age. But more in terms of our spiritual walk with Christ. And with one another. We find an interesting repetition of his words. Which indicates the seriousness of what he's trying to impart to us. He's trying to make us understand this. You have to pay attention to this. It's almost like the words, right? Holy, holy, holy. I remember once, Venkat was sharing and he said, why, why were this repetition of the words? This Hebrew way of saying things many times is more trying to say, he's, and they're emphasizing that aspect even much more. So holy, holy, holy is like they're saying, he is, God is so holy that it, those words are short for us to explain his holiness. And what John is doing here is trying to say, that doing to do the same thing for us and saying, little children, fathers, and repeating this, almost the same things to us. As if he's saying, this is important for you and me to understand. Don't miss this. Don't miss it. And I can't help to notice the change in the phrasing as well. First he starts with, I am writing in his first address. And in the second address he says, I have written. And it leaves me with two possibilities in this, uh, to try to see how this may really mean. Either he's saying, I have written this to a different audience that he has written to in the past, but the same categories of people. Children, young men and uh, the older people, the fathers. Or, he is saying, I just wrote, I am writing to you. And I am repeating that. I just wrote, so I, I have written to you. And he is trying to just bring that emphasis on what he is saying. But to the hearer, to us, he is, what he is really doing is, listen carefully. Hear what I am saying. This is what is expected from you. This is what you should believe. This is what you should understand. Don't miss this. Don't miss it at all. Now when it comes to trying to dig deeper into these categories of maturity, it's very obvious you are a child and then you are a young man and then you are a father. It's not the reverse. And he's talking about these levels of maturity that is there in the midst 
of believers. And what I think is important for us to see and, and see where do we stand. And what is speaking to these different categories of people who are in different levels of maturity. You see, the, to the first, that is to the children. There are two words that he uses. Alright, there are two words that he uses. In the Greek, wherever the words little children occur in this whole chapter, alright, wherever those little children occur, there the word used is technia. Alright, and where the words only children occur, it is Pidean. Now, at first I was wondering why was John trying to differentiate. Both of them seem to mean children. But what is really he talk, what is he really talking? Is it is is are there two further categories within children that he's trying to address? Because I could not help but notice in some places where he has mentioned little children, and some places only he has mentioned children. And it's interesting that those words children in the Greek have different meanings in either of uh, in all those places where I've spoken about. You see, they are, this word technian, uh, by the are plural forms of the word technian and by the end respectively. Now, what does it mean? Let's look further. You see, technian is really related or rather I say it conveys a sense of a relationship or kinship. It is, it's not just somebody else's child. What they are saying is the kingship, it's, it's the lineage, it's, it's the continuation, it's God's children. He's saying you are bought into this relationship, you are bought into this kinship of God. It's you are an offspring. So the word where technia comes is, is more saying that you are the offspring of God. And he's saying little children, he's saying you offspring of God. Alright, he's beginning with the level of maturity from there. He's saying you are the offspring of God. Listen, you are just born. You are just born again. You are just new in the law. And they are, we are, so as to say, we are children of this spiritual kinship with the Father. And then the other word, by the eye, it really is, it's related more, it's used like a slave or a servant. And I was trying to understand that further. It can also probably be used in the sense of being a student. Or can I say, disciple. So where he uses children alone, without a word little, is, I, there is a progression that has happened in terms of growth. And now you're not just born again but now you are a disciple you are at a higher level than you were when you just believed are you all with me so he is distinguishing there is no doubt about it and when he distinguishes he draws upon certain things he gives a specific address to them a specific message to both of these the little children and children that is important for us to understand because that is how we apply it Based on where he stands spiritually. Alright. Let's deal with the first level of maturity. Which is little children. Uh, which is the Greek word technia. You see these are the new believers. And to the new believers. He basically is writing. I think I need some help there. So the new believers, he writes in 1 John chapter 2 verse 12, this is where the word technia comes. He said, I write these things to you because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. Now isn't that a wonderful place to start? Isn't that a wonderful place to start? 
He's just telling these newborn babes. He's just telling these newborn children, these born again children of God, I am writing to you to tell you your sins have been forgiven you. For His name's sake. You see, it's just born again children. It's that first love that we are just experiencing with God. Wow, God has saved me. He's, he's forgiven me. He's washed my sins. He's, he's cleansed me. He's, he's made me new all over again. And at this, this stage, really, all you're expected to do is just rejoice. You know, just just be seated in Christ and just wow experience that wowness of your salvation you know I read this book a book once called by watchman Nee it said sit walk and stand somebody took that book and has not returned it I don't know who it is on the church but I still have to get that book but it's a wonderful book alright so watchman Nee really says a lot of believers try to stand and walk even before being seated. Now when you expect a newborn baby, a newborn baby is born, you don't expect the baby to just start walking. The baby, all the baby is doing is relaxing and doing all the things that you don't want to really clean up for, but you have to clean up the baby. You know, all the susu potty, everything is being done, he is relaxing, everybody is there to take care of me, just let me relax. Sleep for uh, 17 hours a day, 20 hours a day, you know, but he doesn't sleep that all, all his life, right? But that particular phase of a newborn is just that I have been taken care of. I have been taken care of. Let me enjoy this time. There is no hard work for me to do. Except eating and sleeping. And you, you do not expect a baby to sit and to walk. And so what he is saying is that the first stage of a believer is just to be, as it says, you be, just be seated in Christ. You just, just relax, just enjoy this first moment of your salvation. Your realization that your sins have been forgiven. You just, you just, the grace of God is abundantly flowing over you. Bask in this new relationship that you have with God. You realize this new relationship. Just understand the true meaning of that relationship that you have now entered into. So you're really just at the starting phase. You're taken care of. God is taking care of you. He's not really expecting really big things from you at that point in time. But soon he will. But his first expectation is know him. Know God. Realize his forgiveness. This is a phase where we just rejoice. You see, God's forgiveness does not come by degrees. Even the youngest Christian is completely forgiven. They will never be more forgiven. And it is important for us to understand this gift of forgiveness at stage one. It is very important for us to understand this gift of forgiveness. And John continues to say, I am writing to you that your sins are forgiven you, not for your sake. Not for your sake, but for my name's sake. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting that God forgives our sins not for our sake but for His name's sake. Do you know why? What is more dependable? What is more dependable? Our behavior our attitude, our response, or God's character. Who is absolutely sure to make sure that to 
to keep his end of the bargain. Who is it? God. So God is really saying, I don't want to do this for your sake because I know you really are the best. And no, no, no. I'm doing it for my name's sake. I want to make sure that you're depending on me. Your trust is on me and I will never fail you. I will never fail you. If you put your faith in me, in my name, that name is not going to bring shame to you. Because my responsibility, says the Lord, to make sure my name is always glorified. And if I'm going to save you, it is my name's sake. You are the benefactors, yes. But if for the name's sake, for God's name's sake. And this theme of God's name's sake is really there all throughout the Old Testament. You see, the psalmist so well understood it. If you open your Bibles to Psalms 25, 23, verse 3. The Psalm 23 is such a famous psalm. What does it say? He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Psalm 31, verse 3. For you are my rock and my fortress. And for your name's sake, you will lead me and guide me. You see, God is very interested in His reputation. He does not want his name to be taken lightly or put to shame anywhere. And that is why one of the Ten Commandments says, Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You know, it doesn't mean that I just take the name of Jesus and just casually and I have sinned. No, that doesn't mean that. What it really means, do not carry. It has a sense of carrying. Do not carry the name of the Lord your God in vain. Wherever you go, don't put his name to shame. That is what it means. Carry him with reverence. And awe and worship and honor. So God says, I, I do care about my name. And if I'm going to do anything for you, I'm going to save you. It's going to be for my name's sake. I want to be honored there. I want people to know that I am not just anybody. I am this holy, wonderful, righteous God that you are worshipping. Not some clown, not some stone, not something that has no value. The psalmist even raises, raises this as a prayer. Psalms 25 verse 11 says, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. He doesn't say, For my sake, Lord. For your name's sake, Lord. Pardon my iniquity. It says, oh, Psalm 79 verse 9 says, Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name, and deliver us and forgive us our sins for your name's sake. Psalm 109 verse 21 says, But you, O God, the Lord, deal kindly with me for your name's sake. Because of your loving kindness is good, deliver me. You see this theme of his namesake, God doing things for his namesake is prevalent all over. And John is just harping on that. John is just saying the same thing. Your sins have been forgiven you not because of anything but for his namesake. Even the prophets said the same thing. Jeremiah chapter 14 verse 7 says, All though our iniquities testify against us, O Lord, act for your namesake. Truly our apostasies have been many. We have sinned against you. Verse 21 again. Do not despise us oh, uh, for your own name's sake, O oh Lord. And when God deals with people, He deals with people also for His name's sake. Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 44 says, Then you will know that I am the Lord and when I have dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil ways. According to your corrupt deeds, so house of Israel declares all. So you see, the reasoning is very simple. He said, if God has to do it based on your name's sake or your reputation, your reputation is already ruined. Our reputation is pathetic. And if God has to do something for something pathetic, it is meaningless. And says, no, no, no. I will not do it because, because your deeds are already corrupt. You are, you, are, you are a sick people. You are a corrupt people. 
Instead, are your ways are evil. So instead, I'll do it for my name's sake because at least I'll maintain that standard of holiness and righteousness. And so when God forgives the sins of a new bird, of a believer, a new, new, newborn one in Christ, He's saying, rejoice in that. That God is not holding your sins against you. And if He's going to maintain His standard of holiness and righteousness, and for His name's sake, if He's going to make sure that His honor is kept high, He'll do whatever it takes in your life to make sure you stand. Because his name is at stake there. Isn't that wonderful? It's dangerous as well. Because when we play with fire, we will get burnt. We can't fool around with God. Because his name is at stake. And so when we go astray, God disciplines us in love as a father. But the Bible very clear says, at the time that our discipline, it's not very enjoyable. But He will discipline because He is our father. And we will feel pain, we will feel all those things. But His goal is not to throw you away, but to get, to get you back, back to Him. And so at this stage really, he just says enjoy, rejoice, enjoy, understand the forgiveness that you have got. You remember the woman who was a sinner in Luke chapter 7 verse 36 to 50. There is this woman who was a sinner, she was known as a sinner, in, uh, you know that the way the Bible really calls her out or the scripture recognizes her, a woman who was a sinner. So she was a famous sinner. She enters the house of a Pharisee knowing that Jesus is there. And she gets an alabaster ointment or a perfume, a jar of perfume and she's, she's just, she just wants to meet him. She doesn't care about who this Pharisee is all right, because she would ideally not be allowed to enter the house. She entered unwelcomed by the way. She was not invited. All that she knew was she was a sinner. The people knew that she was a sinner. And all that she knew is I know this one person who is in this Pharisee's house. Who can do something about me. And she is ready to take the risk of being even stoned I would say. Or even hit or ridiculed. Because she knew that someone inside that house is there who can save her. And in spite of all this, she, she just goes in. She just goes in that house. And she stands behind Jesus' feet and she's weeping. And she began to wet his feet with her tears. And she kept wiping them with the hair of her head. And kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. You see, she just couldn't stop doing that. All that she could see is here is the Messiah. Here is my Savior. Here is the one who can forgive my sins. Here is the one who can cleanse me. And all I am bothered about is man. She is least concerned of anybody around her. She is very clear. I have approached the one who can save me. And I don't care about anybody else. And she's just weeping. And she's weeping. And she's at the feet of Jesus. And she's wiping her tears off Jesus' feet. And Jesus doesn't say, don't. Please don't do it. He knows what's going through her heart. And he's just allowing her to, serve, to, to really serve him like that. And the Pharisees are irritated and they're like, what does this, if he really was a prophet, he would know who this woman was, who sent to woman, how can he even allow her? And Jesus reads the Pharisees' mind and he gives a parable of the two debtors to him. And he says this, money lender had two debtors, one who had owed 500 denarii and another 50. And when they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. Jesus asked the question to the Pharisee, which of them will love him more? 
and to which he responded the one who forgave more that Jesus gave this wonderful statement he says for this reason I say to you her sins which are many have been forgiven because she uh, uh, because for she loved much but he who is forgiven little loves little and he said to her your sins have been forgiven you know this, this wonderful statement I just found it so wonderful that she knows her sins are much she knows she has so much sinned against God and when she receives that forgiveness he says the response of her is very clear who, who has been forgiven much will love much in the measure that you have been forgiven will be, the, will be the measure of your love towards God and that made me think if I'm a new believer it is so very important for me to stand and understand and count my sins Right from the time I can remember, just count my sins, write it down. Oh, these are all the things that let it be run into pages and pages and pages. Everything that I have done, because it's so important. Because the more I understand how much I've been forgiven, the more I will be able to respond with love to God. Unfortunately, most of us take our forgiveness so lightly. Think of our sins so lightly that we don't respond in love. We feel what God has done, oh, praise God for it. But truly, there is no first love. There is no really true love that we are expressing to God. And the first commandment and the greatest commandment that He expects us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, does not really happen in our lives. Have you wondered why? Because we have not understood how much of our sin has been forgiven we may feel we have sinned so little in our lives no 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 look back measure your life according to what the word of God says is sin and then we will realize how much we have sinned and when we realize that and then we look at forgiveness of God and we look at his grace we will be able to love Him and worship Him and surrender to Him and thank Him and understand the height and the depth and the width of God's love towards us in Christ Jesus. Are you with me? Sometimes we want, we don't rejoice or enjoy this phase of a new believer. We just rush through. You want to just start walking and running. Sit. Walk. Stand. Take it a step at a time. A phase at a time. Don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry. You know the stages of how a butterfly comes out from a, what do you call that? A cocoon, right? If someone tries to throw it out before time, what will happen? It will die. It, it can't survive. If you try to put a day before it's supposed to come out, it may not be able to fly at all. It may be alive but not be able to fly at all. Because it has, it has not gone according to the time of what it should have, what should happen. And same thing is for us. Let, let's not hurry things as a new believer. Let's, let's dig deep in our understanding of the forgiveness that we have received. You see the word technia is also used in 1 John 2 chapter 28. Now I am not going to share a lot on those, uh, on those further scriptures but I just want us to understand what he is saying here because the word is used there. It says, now little children abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone will, you know that everyone also who practice righteousness is born of him. You see, he's referring to this whole newborn phase. He's still stuck at the newborn phase. Think of this righteous little children and think of this, you know, this righteousness is born of him. Why is he talking about this? You see, he's, he's really adjuring the new believers to first abide in Christ 
you out, outside of Christ you will not live. So listen to me, new believers. He said, make sure you are in Christ always. Did not Christ say this in John chapter 15, verse 4? Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. It's very simple, isn't it? And what John is telling a newborn, a born again Christian is, as you realize your sins have been forgiven, and you rejoice in that, make sure you are abiding in the wine that you have been put into. You were once a wild branch, but now you were put into the good wine that is Christ himself. Make sure you remain there. Make sure you abide in Christ. That is the only way you will grow and bear fruit. So if you want to grow further and not just being stuck at an infancy level, make sure that you are remaining in the tree because as long as you remain in Christ, only then you will get the nourishment and you will grow and you will bear fruit. Are you with me? So John is making sure a newborn believer understands these things. And he's also saying that, you know, if you know he is righteous, if you know Christ is righteous, if you know the wine, if you know the wine and you know the good fruit that is being born there, he's saying you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. What he's saying is also make sure that you do not hang around with the wild branches anymore. Because at this phase, wrong company will ruin you. You need to break all ties with everything that is evil. You need to break all ties with sin. You need to cut yourself off from everything that is not the true wine. And join yourself completely through the true wine. It is a very important phase in your life. Ask any new parent. Will you give your newborn baby bad food? Bad milk? You will never do that. Because the best milk, the mother's milk that the babies get. What, the, what is the meaning of that? Why not an alternate option? No, it says, the mother's milk is the best milk for a newborn baby. Because that's the best nourishment and the healthiest nourishment that the baby can get at that point in time. And John is saying, make sure that you are hanging around with those who practice righteousness. The way you know that they are of God, they are born of Him, is to know by their deeds. Be part of a church which is practicing righteousness. May your friend circle be that which practices righteousness. Because any wrong influence on you can ruin your growth. And you will have a mixture of godliness and ungodliness. And it will be a horrible thing for you. Do we agree? So there are implications of this new phase. And then he goes on to the next level of maturity. And that is the word Vaidya. And he says to these people, these children, he says, uh, sorry, it's not little children, it's just children. But he says in 1 John 2.13, he says, because you know the Father. Now you look, can you see the progression? There's a wonderful progression here. He's saying that, as you see, it, it, it's the word here, here used, is again used here in, in 1 John 2, 18. It says, children, it is the last star and just as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last star. 
but you have an anointing of from the Holy One and you know. You said this is not expected from a real newborn born again believer. This kind of understanding. Whereas that, that newborn believer is really enjoying, he's supposed to be enjoying in the forgiveness of God and the grace of God. And really he's he's not come to the point of understanding oh the antichrist is coming, what am I supposed to do? Am I ready for it? But this is for a person who is now a disciple, who is a student of Jesus, who is learning from Jesus and now has understood, he has gone through scripture, he has abided in Christ and, and the nourishment is coming in, the knowledge is coming in, the, the Jesus is speaking, the Holy Spirit is speaking and now he is aware, I, I, I mean I need to be careful about things around me, things that will harm me, things that are against God. Things that are contrary to God. I need to be aware of those things. And protect myself from those things. And that is what he is talking about these kind of people here. This next level of maturity that we are seeing. You see we, we know it's not just a, a point of rejoicing now. At this point of maturity we are not just rejoicing. We are, yeah, rejoicing never ends but... Now we just start adding to our responsibility, start becoming more responsible. Now we start crawling, now we start begin to walk. But we take support. Right? <coughs> A baby that's learning to walk takes support. He's aware of the sharp objects, probably, but he may, may or may not have the power to prevent his fall but the people around him will keep an eye on that baby as he's learning to walk and will protect when the baby falls will keep the baby away from things which are going to harm the baby or hurt the baby but at this phase this, the baby has to at least look around and see what or the, not baby right? the child has to be aware of what is really harm what can harm him he cannot live in a state of I am just lying down, people are taking care of me, no, no, now you are starting to walk, so you better be aware. You better be aware of your surrounding, better be aware of who is, who has good intentions towards you and who has bad intentions towards you. Who will love you, who will abuse you. And you got to be aware of that, you got to be careful of that. And that is what John is telling, this next level of maturity, people who are this level, next level of maturity, who are children as well. But a little more knowledge about knowledgeable of the words, word of God. The next level is the level of young men. Now, when he addresses the young men, he says to them, Because you have overcome the evil one. And he also says, Again, in the second address, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Again, he is repeating that you have overcome the evil one. See, children are expected to grow. And now, at the stage of where they are young men, we would normally see children who are young, become young men be stronger. As parents, I want my children to be strong as they are growing, not weak. And God expects the same from us. And as He's saying, at the stage where you have abided, you are aware of your surroundings, now you have digged deep into the Word of God. You are spending time on the Word of God. Day and night you are engrossed with the Word of God. And you are growing stronger and stronger. And he's saying, because now you are strong. Young men, because you are strong. And you, the word of God abides in you. That means you have read the word, you are meditating on the word of God so much that it is now part of you. You have overcome. Now, because of that, you have overcome the evil one. 
you have overcome the evil one you see Paul criticizes those who want to remain infants and children all the time he criticizes them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1 to 3 he says this and brethren could I uh, uh, I and I brethren could not speak to you as spiritual men he saying, but as, as to men of flesh as to infants in Christ I gave you milk to drink not solid food for you were not able to receive it indeed even now you are not able to receive it for you are still fleshly he saying it's a shame that you are still on milk it's a shame because he, he, he makes this progress. He's saying, even now you are not able to have it. Even now I have to give you milk after so much of time. Why? Because they mixed around with the wrong company. They were mixed around with, with things that were not supposed to be mixed around with. They had adulterated milk. They were not dwelling on the word of God as they had to dwell on the word of God. And what happened because of that? They were still fleshly. Their focus was still on the things of the world. Fame, money, property, car, this, that. Everything. They just still wanted, oh these things are still, I can't leave these things. These are still mine. I still want to hold on to it. They, they, I, I just cannot live without all these things. And he's saying, as long as you have that kind of attitude of not wanting to leave this for the sake of Christ, or rather I would put it this way, counting that as least important in comparison to Christ, as long as you do that, or don't do that rather I would say, you are still fleshly. And you are still on milk. How long? Can you imagine, I am standing here with a milk bottle in my hand and as I am talking to you, I am drinking a milk bottle. How will it look? Huh? I'm sucking. <coughs> and we'll keep sucking. It's disgraceful. And Paul is saying, you're not like that. You all should be eating solid food, you're all having a still of milk. And Francis Chan gives this nice illustration. He says, you know why? Because you suck. You all suck. You are still sucking milk. When are you supposed to eat food? And we need to be careful about that. We cannot just say, okay, I am saved and that's all I, am ca I care about. I am going to heaven, that's all I care about. The grace of God is sufficient to me. The forgiveness of sins is there. So all that's all I care about. Let me live how I want to live. Let me mix around with the world. So I can enjoy the world. And I can enjoy the, the fact that I can still be saved and go to heaven. No, he is saying you are, you are foolishness. That's foolish thought. That's foolish thought. You are not supposed to be like that. You see Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11. It says the same, he continues the same thing. He says concerning Jim, that is Jesus. We have much to say. And it's hard to explain. Since you have become dull of hearing. Chapter 5 verse 11. Or it's hard to explain about Jesus. Now this, the church of Christ has come to a stage. Where Paul is saying. It is hard to explain to you. Because you are dull of hearing. You know why? He says this. For though by this time you ought to be teachers. You have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come, come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. For he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So Paul is very clearly talking to the church and saying you should not be on milk all your life. You have to grow as a child of God. You have to become young men. You have to become fathers. You have to become strong. You have to be a warrior. Besides the song Senaoka Yehovah 
यो हमारा सेना हो इज अ लॉर्ड ऑफ आर्मीज एंड इमेजिन इज आर्मी इज ड्रिंकिंग मिल्क द लॉर्ड इज स्टैंडिंग बिफोर बिफोर द एनिमी बिहेंड इज आर्मी एवरीबडी दूध बॉटल इन हैंड that's not the picture of lord of armies you are not included in that army if you have still have a milk bottle in your hand you are not because you are not ready for war he will not lead you into battle because you are not ready you will die young men spiritually strong men and as a men it is women as well so don't just put up thing on okay men are expected to all women are out of picture no it's 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 basically a spiritual picture of the church all right young men are supposed to be strong they are supposed to have the word of god abiding in their heart they are supposed to soak themselves in on scripture day and night the psalm is so very well puts it then someone when he says he is like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water who is this person who is planted by the streams of water he who meditates on the word of god day and night he saying that kind of person is the one who is strong because all his nourishment is coming from the streams of living water and in its season he will bear fruit he is not fruitless she is not fruitless but will bear good fruit and revelation talks about this picture of this people nations will come to the tree at the tree to take the fruit god desires each one of us to come to this space of spiritual maturity each one of us there is no exception there is no exception is it jesus was firmly rooted in the word of god Yes, he was God. There's no doubt about it. But the very fact that he, uh, his childhood talks about how he was, uh, how he went in the temple, he, he spoke. He, he is just he, he. He basically made sure that he understood the word of God well, as as a man. And when 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 tempted, he used the word of God in the right context. Satan brought the word of God in the wrong context, and Jesus says, "No, that's not how it's supposed supposed to be understood. This is the right way of understanding the scriptures." he was a strong young man that's a picture of a strong young man jesus himself gives that picture to us and says you need to be like this and as a result of that we overcome evil we overcome the evil one you see when we look, when I, i try to look up uh, and even in the cell that we did I, i got you know i realized this overcoming the evil one this word is used in uh, in in relation to the armor of god as well and i just did a opposite of that i said if the, we know what the armor of god is obviously it is protecting us against the opposites of what the armor of god talks about so let's see what those are you see the evil one is the devil and all those who work on us we are are called, are called his sons and what do they come come against us with what are their weapons because of which we need that armor what are their weapons their weapons are the evil one desires to snatch away what god has sown in our heart you see matthew 13 19 the evil one prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour devour you see as young men we need to be strong why because these are all the things we are up against the evil one has schemes set up against us and flaming arrows to harm us it's like you're walking around if you walk around without armor you will be shot dead we are up against rulers against powers against world forces of this darkness against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places young men strong are against this kind of people not against flesh and blood but against spiritual forces of the darkness uh, of darkness in the heavenly places and you know what will be attacked with will be attacked with deception will be attacked with lies will be attacked with all sorts of evil 
we will be attacked with doubt fear hopelessness condemnations false doctrines prayerlessness and fake believers who do not have the holy spirit claiming to be god's children and this is all i have taken as just the opposite of what the armor needs the armor that we need so when we use our armor we are protecting ourselves against all this so young men at your state of spiritual maturity where you are expected to be strong we have a battle to fight we are soldiers of god we have been given an armor a spiritual armor that we need to put on and that's where paul also starts with ephesians interestingly he starts with the same thing he says finally in ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 finally be strong in the law and how do we be strong in the lord he says be strong in the lord and in the strength of his might not our might put on the full armor of god that you will be able to stand against the schemes of the devil for your struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the powers against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places therefore take up the full armor of god so that when you so that you will be able to resist the evil day and having done everything to stand firm stand firm therefore have it girded your lions with truth you see the opposite of truth is lies and having the breastplate of righteousness opposite of righteousness is evil deeds evil evil that is there around us having showed your faith with the feed of the preparation of the gospel of peace what is the opposite of peace it's war it's about a terrible things that are there that that are intended other than peace in addition to all take up taking up the shield of faith what is the opposite of faith it's fear it's doubt with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take on the helmet of salvation opposite of salvation is condemnation and put a sword of the spirit which is the word of god when we don't have the word of god we are not strong in the law so the devil will try to keep us away from reading his word with all prayer and supplica and uh, petition pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer opposite of prayer is prayerlessness and not being able to pray in the spirit means we do not have the spirit of god i have just look at it in the opposite and says and with this in view be on alert and with all perseverance and petition for all the saints you see we do not send infants and children to war god does not send infants and children to war he sends young men he sends the fathers he sends the strong people to war and he wants warriors he wants warriors to fight for him he is recruiting warriors he is recruiting people who are strong who have the armor on and we play a very important role in that calling you see we are supposed to stand for each other the young men are supposed to those who are strong in the lord are supposed to take care of the children and infants in romans chapter 15 verse 1 It says now we who are strong ought to bear the weakness of those who without strength and not just please ourselves. Just imagine a church with only children and no one strong. What will happen? Denny me has such wonderful inroads. He can just come and attack. But God places strong people in our midst, and the children need to look to the strong. The strong need to take care of the weak. We need each other. We do not live to please ourselves. We need each other. The strong have God on their side. and when we have god on our side the strong do not have to fear whether they will lose because what does jesus say john chapter uh, john 17 chapter i do not ask you to he prays jesus this is jesus's prayer father i do not ask you to take them out of the world but to keep them from the evil one 
2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 3 but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one he says 1 John 5 18 for we, we know that no one who is born of God sins but he who is born of God keeps him and the evil one does not touch him we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one James 4 7 submit therefore to God this is the devil and he will flee from you you see this is when we are strong God is on our side he is, he is there to strengthen us he is there to protect us he is there to lead us into the battle but you know what the battle is already won it's just that we are just walking with him but we look out for the weak and the children and finally the last level of maturity is the, those of fathers and of those who are fathers what does he say because you know him who has been from the beginning because you know him who has been from the beginning now these people these fathers in the church these fathers in the body of Christ are those who are very strong in the Lord those who are really who love the Lord who, 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 whose faith is really unmatched so as to say maybe at times there are failures but they are strong they are, they are the ones who can, we can look up to and they have, they have this one they have had this so much of wonderful experience or really of this relationship with God that they know they can trust Him they are secure they are unshaken they are firm they are, they are just so much in love with God they are so much wow I, I, just, I just want to do God's work I, I, there is nothing else that I can think of that is more important and these fathers is what is required in the church like David Guzek says they are like great oak trees in the Lord they have grown big and strong through the years You see, disciples at this level of maturity help counsel the younger generation. They rebuke and love those who are, who, who are straying away. And you would typically see fathers as people who are in the fivefold ministry or functioning in the role of the fivefold ministry or elders in the church, for example. The fivefold ministry talks about apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers who, who really have, they are not new in the Lord, they have been in the Lord for a very long time. Nothing can easily shake them and we learn from them. You see, Paul was like a father to Timothy. He was like a father to many of the many churches that he planted. The apostles were like fathers to the churches that were that, that were planted. So my ask to us today, in closing, where do you stand? Where do I stand? How many years since you have known the Lord? How many years? Do you consider yourself as a little child still? Children? Young men? Or fathers? Where do you stand? Where do I stand? And if you feel that you are not fitting any of these categories, you are not a believer. But these are serious questions to ask us. God did not save you so that you will remain a baby always. He wants, to be young, wants you to be young men. He wants you to be fathers. He wants you to grow in Him. Grow in love with Him. And let's, let this be our prayer. Let us be our prayer that we challenge ourselves to go to the next, next level or even start right. Can it be our prayer to ask God for help, for the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us? That, that we may be equipped for the work of God's service, that, that we may be strong in the law. And that's as Ephesians puts it, that we may, uh, we may attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God. To a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. You see our measurement of maturity? 
What is the measurement of maturity? To a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. We are supposed to be like Christ. I think that is how mature he wants us to be as fathers. That is where the fivefold ministry comes into, uh, into existence, where they help the church to become that. As we learn from the fathers, as the children learn from the young men, as the young men learn from the fathers, we, uh, the whole goal is we all become like Christ. And let that be our prayer today. Amen? Amen. Can we just, can you just pray? Can, can I ask Tanga, if you can just come forward, Tanga, and just pray aloud. Pray for all of us that what we have learned that is be real in our life. Bow heads. Father, I want to thank you for this time. Thank you for this morning time. Thank you, Lord, for your word. It is unfailing. It's the same yesterday, today and forever. And it's the food that we can eat and live. Thank you, Lord, for the truths that we have heard today and helping us to, Lord, understand our own state, to analyze and see where we stand. I pray, Master Lord Jesus, that for all the children among us, spiritual children who are growing, I pray for your undiluted spiritual milk to be fed to them. I pray, Master Lord Jesus, that you would protect them from all adulterations, false doctrines, false understanding, false view of Christ. I pray that you would protect them from the flaming arrows of the evil one and deceptions that will keep them as infants. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would help them to grow to maturity into young, being a young men and women of God who stand strong and guide children and who resist the evil one, who stand strong in various circumstances and situations and not wavering in their lives. Pray for the young men and women among us, O oh Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help them to take their stand against the evil one. To be guardians of the church, protecting from all the deceptions and lies of the enemy, the attacks of the enemy to lift up the faint-hearted, the weak and bring them along, take them along in this spiritual journey. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would give them your strength and they would grow in watching in prayer, not grow weary in doing, doing good. And they'll be saturated by the word of God and indeed like Jesus Christ who resisted the devil by the scriptures and the right understanding of the scriptures, young men and women will do the same thing that they'll soak themselves in scriptures and soak themselves in prayer and go out to bring even others outside into the fold of Christ and safeguard those who are inside the fold. I pray for the fathers among us. I pray, Master Lord Jesus, that you would fill them with your wisdom, fill them with your knowledge to guide the next generation to be a lighthouse to guide the church in the right direction and even outside the global body of Jesus Christ that there will be a light that shines to lead young men and children in the light of Jesus Christ walking in the light and I pray that you would be with them be with all of us Master Lord Jesus help us Father Lord to grow in spiritual maturity that none of us would stay stagnant, O oh Lord Jesus. I pray that you would open our eyes this morning. Anyone who have been deceived in any area, that you would open our eyes to 
see the truth in that particular area. I pray for your light to shine upon us, Master Lord Jesus. The light of Jesus Christ shine upon our hearts and inner man that we might be enlightened to see the truth. Let not Satan blind our eyes, O Lord Jesus. I pray that you would open our eyes and behold the wonderful truths in your word. We come at us as dear hands, Father Lord Jesus. Truly, I pray that you would make us more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. Come at us as dear hands, Father. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Amen.